Hi. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Uh, we tested this an hour ago in the other room and it worked just fine. But um, uh, this projector is not playing nicely in the sandbox with my laptop. So we are off to get a different laptop and I have a backup which is uh, everything on a USB drive. We're going to try and see if that laptop will talk to this projector. Uh, if not, I have one in my room, but as you all know, getting to the elevators and up to the room and back would take three hours or so. So, uh, yeah, uh, apologies. Now, I still have some fun stories, even if we don't have the fun visuals. We'll, we'll try one. I'll try to give you the stories, and then once we have the laptop, we'll go through the visuals, so you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. Um, who here has been to one of my talks before? All right. Can you guys verify that it's a cool talk? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've packed a room before, standing room only, and so now at least everybody has a chair while we're waiting. So, so this is good. Um, so, hi. My name is Ilanka Dunin. I uh, have been, I'm a long time Dragon Con speaker. It's, uh, I think this is my 20th year, but, but I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I love Dragon Con. It has changed my life, literally. I would not be speaking on cryptography today if it were not for Dragon Con. So you guys are my home peeps. Um, so originally, also, another part of my life, I'm a game developer. So I was making computer games, online games, um, then social games, then smartphone games. And about 20 years ago, uh, I was making massively online uh, games, uh, Gemstone, Dragon Realm, Cyber Strike, uh, the Hercules and Xena games to go with the TV shows. I was the executive producer of those. Um, and um, so making those games, and, and by the way, Cyber Strike was the first ever online game of the year. They created the category for us, like they had strategy game, educational game, tactical game, but they never had an online game until CyberStrike came along and they're like, we should make a category for this. So we opened that category, thank you very much. <laughs> and um, so that got game of the year and then we got other attention and then I got a call from the heads of Dragon Con saying, why don't you come down to Dragon Con and speak on games? And I said, sure. So I came down and I was speaking in this track, the electronics track, and at the end of the day, I get to meet the other speakers in the electronics track, uh, the hackers that were coming in from SE 2600, Southeast 2600. 20, anyone know why it's called 2600? 2600 because that's the frequency that you could beam into a payphone in order to be able to make free calls. So this is the old, what they call the phone freakers, P-H-R-E-A-K, freakers. So, so the, uh, it was called Southeast United States 2600, and they had a convention that they were running up in Nashville called Freaknik, P-H-R-E-A-K, Freaknik. And um, so I'm meeting the other speakers here, and you know, we meet at the end of the day, we have a beer or whatnot, and they've been telling me about a code that had been released at the Nashville Convention, Freaknik, as a challenge to the attendees at the con. And no one had cracked it. So here they were a year later, here at Dragon Con again, handing out the flyers with these codes and saying, hey, if anyone can crack it, there's still a prize, a free trip to HackerCon. So I picked up the flyer with all the other flyers you get at a convention, and I took it home, to meet, uh, home with me to St. Louis, where I was living at the time. And I got really bored one week, I think I was homesick with the flu, and I'm like, oh, oh, look at this, this code. And I'd always kind of been interested in codes since I was a little girl. Like, when they had those crossword puzzle magazines that you can still get, the Dell uh, puzzle magazines, and I would get these magazines and I'd ignore all the crossword puzzles, and I would go for the little cryptic quips that would be in these magazines. And the logic puzzles, I would do those. Then I'd throw away the magazine, and then I'd wait for the next month's magazine, crossword puzzles or pencil puzzles and word games. That was my favorite, because they didn't have many crossword puzzles. It was mostly the codes and the logic puzzles. So I'd always kind of been interested in that. So I had the Freaknik code. This was the Freaknik 3 code. And I started working on it, and I got obsessed. Anyone who's like done coding or heavy duty puzzle work, you know, you get into this zone where that's all you're seeing. It's like the rest of the, work, the, rest of the world kind of blacks out, 
And like my friends would, call, hey, Alaka, do you want to go to a movie? And I'm like, don't talk to me unless you want to talk about a coat. I, I was like, <laughs> I'm really in the zone. And uh, it took me 10 days. Uh, it felt like a lot longer, but it was 10 days, and I cracked it. And I won a free trip to the next free, the next free thing, and I won free drinks, t-shirts, hotel, the whole nine yards. And I thought, hey, you know, that's kind of cool. Uh, so I went around cracking a bunch of other coats in the hacker scene. And I actually cracked so many that they banned me from competition. <laughs> like, at the, there was another hacker con called AtlantaCon, which was for hackers, and on their code, the sheet of paper, and they had the code at the top of the sheet of paper, and at the bottom it said, no, past solvers are ineligible for prizes associated with solving AtlantaCon codes. Give someone else a chance, Ilanka. <laughs> so I cracked that one, too. Uh, and, and so, you know, it was just kind of fun. It was kind of a hobby. And then something really serious, really sad happened, which was September 11th. And uh, I was as enraged as everyone else by what had happened. And I was sort of wondering if I could use all this code experience that I had to help with the battle on terrorism. So how many people here have heard of Bletchley Park? Or have seen the movie Imitation Game? Probably you know, similar number of hands. So during World War II, they uh, um, were trying to crack the German ciphers that used a machine called the Enigma. You may have heard this, the Enigma machine. And this was with Alan Turing, if that name rings any bell. And it was a very labor-intensive process, and they needed lots and lots of people to help with solving these Enigma ciphers. They'd get, they could capture them, but they didn't know what they said, so they needed people kind of going through and figuring out the puzzles. So what they did... Scott, can you look? Yeah, I'll let you know that. Okay, he's going to work on it. I'm going to keep talking. So, um, where was it? Oh yeah, so they needed lots of people to solve these puzzles, and they didn't have enough people in the military, so they went out and looked, looked for people in the civilian world. So what they did is they put really difficult puzzles in the newspapers. True story. They put difficult puzzles in the newspaper across the United Kingdom and said, can you solve these puzzles? If so, come and help with the war effort. And so people were coming in from all different walks of life, you know, housewives, gardeners, anybody that had that kind of mind that could do puzzles. So I was wondering, could I help with the war on terrorism? So I called my local FBI in St. Louis, and I said, hey, can I help? And they said no. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, I'm, I'm a persistent person. You know, when someone says no, you can't do that, or it can't be done, that's like waving a red flag in front of me. So I kept asking. And as it happened, my life with games kind of intertwined with this, because I had to call the FBI periodically, because we were new. We made this first online games, and we're taking in credit cards. And these, this is a new thing, people giving us credit cards online. So people giving us credit cards, most of them honest, legal, you know, law-abiding citizens, some not so much. So we were having people coming in and giving us fraudulent card numbers, or were coming in and giving us good numbers. They were using us as a way to test if a card number was good or not. Like, we'd say, okay, do you want to play our game? And they'd say yes, and we'd ask for a credit card number, and we'd test it against the database. Is it a good credit card number? And we'd go, okay, it's, okay, come in and play the game. And, oh, no, bad number, and we'd say, no, give us a different credit card number. So there were people from certain parts of the United States, criminals, that were using us as a way to test. Say they bought 100 credit card numbers on the black market, and they wanted to know were these good numbers or bad numbers. So they would come to our game site and use us as a way of testing. Does, does this make sense? Going around? So when we'd see that, we'd see, boy, we're getting 20 tests for credit cards on this one account in New England. And we've had trouble in New England before. So I'd like, hey, FBI, you know, you might want to check this. This particular IP coming in from New England seems to be giving us a lot of bad credit, no, credit card numbers. It's something you might want to test. So, so I was, I'm on the phone with the FBI periodically, and I kept saying, can I help? Can I help? Can I help? Finally, I got an agent. Finally, I got an agent who said, what is it that you know about? And I said, well, you know, I've been cracking all these codes in the hacker scene, and you know, that's ROC 13, and PGP, and Yu-Yu encoding, and steganography. And, and he said, wait, steganography? 
we've been hearing rumors that Al-Qaeda was using steganography as a way of planning the September 11th attacks. Now, steganography is a way of hiding a message inside of a picture. So there's something in the picture. So you look at the picture, and you can't really tell that there's a message in there, but it's hidden in the bits and the bytes. So the FBI, I'm kind of saying this to the FBI agent, and I can tell over the phone his eyes are kind of rolling up in the back of his head, and he's saying, look, we're sure that there's big brains in Washington, D.C. that understand this stuff, but we're here in St. Louis, St. Louis FBI. Cryptography is not our mission. Maybe you could come in and kind of give us a little talk. Give us a little talk about what steganography is uh, so that so we understand it, because they were doing something really smart. Ah, progress, woo! Okay, right now! <laughs> Okay, should I keep talking or can I keep my fingers crossed? What do you guys, you, you guys want me to keep talking? Or yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so the St. Louis FBI is saying come in and give a talk because they were doing something really smart after September 11th is realizing that the different agencies have not been talking to each other. The FBI did not know what the CIA knew. The CIA did not know what, I mean they didn't even have Homeland security at the time, but what like the district uh, attorney generals knew. And so they were trying to set up these little talks uh, every so often, like once a month or so, where they would have representatives of each agency along with members of what they call the private sector, the commercial sector, coming in and all sharing information so they could do a better job of preparing for any other potential terrorist plot. So I was one of the people that they invited in to talk about steganography. And I... Uh, all right. So I, they thought, I think they thought I was going to give like a little 10-minute talk. I put together a 70-slide PowerPoint presentation about what steganography was and how to find it and you know how I didn't think Al-Qaeda was using it, but this is why I thought that and that is it. So, and then one of them. Um, okay, can we put a pin in it? I'll come back to the story? Okay, all right. <laughs> Story, then we'll go to the slides. Okay. Um, so, where was I? War on terrorism, giving a talk, 70, 70 slide PowerPoint presentation. So, I went in and I gave this talk to FBI and Secret Service and uh, Attorney General, and I also started getting invited to different universities to be giving this talk. And now I do need to put a pin it to come into another part of my life that was kind of dovetailing with this, which is I have a cousin who works in Washington, D.C., and he had a really close call on that morning of September 11th. And he works occasionally in the Pentagon, and he was actually on his way to the Pentagon that morning, uh, but he was running late because he was having printer problems. And he got his printer problems sorted out, and then he's on his way to the Pentagon, and he's checking his cell phone for messages, and his phone actually crashed from all the messages on it, from people who were saying a plane just hit the Pentagon, don't go. And the plane actually hit where he was supposed to be. Some of the people he was supposed to brief were killed. And I know this was part of my, sorry, this was part of my rage. And uh, so after September 11th, I went to Washington, D.C. to hug my cousin. And uh, we, uh, went to the Pentagon, and we put an American flag there. And then we're uh, driving around D.C., and he says, this is your first time in D.C., is there anything else you'd like to see? And I thought about it, and I thought, I said, you know, while I was working on that Freaknik code, there was various dead ends in it, like solve this, but then you didn't need to solve that, and you need to go and solve something else. And one of the dead ends was go to the CIA website, and you'll see a picture of a sculpture, that sculpture, and saw this next. Well, I went and I looked at it, and this was the first time I'd heard of this sculpture, which is called Cryptos. And I went researching it, and Cryptos is in the center of CIA, CIA headquarters, has four codes on it, three of the four have been solved, the fourth has been solved. It's one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world. So I went and I'm working on the Freaknik code, and I oh ha ha, a famous unsolved code. And I went back to work on the the Freaknik code, which, by the way, when I finally cracked it, after ten days, 
I realized that the guy who wrote it had not guessed that a woman might be the person to crack it. Because at the center of it, it said, okay, because it's like an onion, and at the center of it, it said, aha, you've cracked the Freaknik 3 code. Now, to announce your win, go to this hacker mailing list, SC2600, and post a message in haiku or sonnet format about why you like to go swimming with bow-legged women and swim between their legs. <laughs> so it's 3 o'clock in the morning, right, and I'm looking at this, and I'm like, <laughs> but I posted, now the guy who wrote it is actually one of the other DragonCon speakers. He was one of those people that, that I'd met early on. And he goes by the handle Johnny X. So I posted my message of, you know, haiku is 575. So I posted Johnny X and I will discuss things aquatic if he wears a suit. So, so that was my message. And, and, and going through these layers with these dead ends and red herrings, one of them is going to crypto. So now we come back to this other line in my life, which is I'm driving around to see with my cousin. He's saying, is there anything else you want to see? And they're like, no, just you. And he says, that's nice. You know, I like seeing you too, but you know, DC kind of has a lot of tourist attractions. Is there anything else you'd like to see? And I thought about it. And, you know, that, that crypto sculpture. It's a... Uh, yeah, I want to go see that. And he said, okay, where is it? And I said, it's in the center of CIA headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, okay, CIA is in Langley. Uh, let's see what we can do. So it was, it was oh, difficult at the time. This is pre-Google Earth and all that. Because CIA, it doesn't have a street address. You can't just go and say, MapQuest, give me directions to CIA headquarters. And so I'm looking and looking, at, and how do I figure this out? And, and I got two big clues. One was that I did have some satellite reconnaissance pictures that you could get online of the Langley, Virginia area. And I knew CI was in Langley somewhere. And the other was that um, there were Tom Clancy movies who would have these things like da -da -da -da, okay, da -da -da, CIA headquarters. So I knew what the outline of the building looked like. So I went looking around, you know, in these satellite pictures, and I found the outline of the building. Okay, so now I, I knew roughly where it was. And another thing, which was something that someone shouldn't have done in an OPSEC, but I found online someone was giving directions to their kid's soccer match. And in the directions, it said, go down this highway, and then after the sign to the CIA, take the next exit. <laughs> go there. So my, so my cousin and I, we go there and, we, and then we see, I know we're, we're not thinking super clearly at the time. We're figuring that we're going to take the exit to the CIA and it's going to be like this big installation with a service road around it and we're going to like drive around the service road and we're going to peek over the wall and we're going to see cryptos. Didn't work like that. So we, we take the exit to CIA and there's no branches, there's no service road. You're right into a gate, big gate barbed wire guard shack with big guys with guns come pouring out of this guard shack. We're asking very reasonable questions right after September 11. Who are you and why are you here? So my cousin and I are like, oh, we're, we're here to see cryptos. And the guards can be relaxed a little. And they said, sorry, you can only get in for official business. And so my cousin and I, you know, can we talk our way into CIA? And, <laughs> So, so we, we kind of like say, well, um, is there like a public tour day? And the guards are saying, nope, sorry, official business only. Like, can can we get our congressperson to give us an invite? And guard, no, no, official business only. And like, well, what if I have like a cousin who works at CIA? Can can they get me in? And the guards, nope, official business only. And like I said, these are big guys with big guns. And so my cousin and I finally drove away. But I'm thinking, okay, someone just told me. I can't get in. Red flag, okay? So this is the official business, official business. So now we go back to this other line in my life where I'm, I'm working on this talk that I'm giving to FBI, Secret Service, Attorney General, and then I'm wondering, can I use this talk to do the official business and I'll be the that gets me into CIA? So I worked something about cryptos into the talk. Now, steganography a way is, is, is a way of hiding messages inside of pictures. So I put two pictures up on a slide, one of them that didn't have something hidden in it, and that same picture of something that did have something hidden in it, so you can't see any difference with the naked eye. Well, the picture that I chose was a picture of cryptos that I'd gotten from the CIA website. And when I gave that talk, when I got to that slide, every time I got that slide, I'm like, oh, 
that's a sculpture in CIA headquarters. Boy, I'd love to give this talk at CIA someday. <laughs> so, as I said, I'm getting invited to universities and, and different government agencies, and, and I, you know, boy, I'd love to give this talk at CIA someday. So, I'm in Las Vegas at one point at a convention, the biggest hacker convention in the world. It's called DEF CON. How many people have heard of DEF CON? Yeah, a few people, okay, big con. And this is back when it's in the Alexis Park Hotel. So, roof tent, about a thousand people in there. And they wanted me to give my talk about steganography. The big sign, Lanka speaks on steganography. So, I'm giving my talk about steganography, and I show the slide, and oh, this is Cryptos at CIA headquarters in Langley. I'd love to give this talk at CIA someday. So I finish the talk, end of the talk. People come up, they give you business cards and things. And one person comes up, and they lean across the podium, and they look me in the eye, and they say, I work at Langley. I think I can get you in. <laughs> I just blew their cover at the hacker convention. So, <laughs> so I wanted to make sure that they were really someone from CIA and not just a hacker who was pulling my chain and saying that they worked at CIA. So they only gave me a first name and a phone number. I'm serious, this is, I'm not making this up. They gave me a first name and a phone number. And then after the uh, convention, I called the phone number and said, yeah, I'd be happy to go to CIA and give this talk as long as I get time to look at the sculpture, cryptos. And they said, okay, we, we think we can arrange that. Send us your slides. And I said, wait a minute. I want you to prove that you work at CIA. And they said, well, how, should, how can we prove that? And I said, well, send me an email from an official CIA address. And uh, they said, well, I, I, I don't have an email from an official CIA address. And I said, well, get an email from an official CIA address. <laughs> And so about a week went by, and then I get an email from blah, 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 at ucia.gov, unclassified cia.gov. So I wrote back to it. So we had two, and I knew it wasn't a spoofed email address. We're going back and forth. And, um, and then we worked out so that I could go and give a talk. And there were also issues with they wanted to pay me, and I didn't want to be paid. And they kept saying, how much do you want to be paid? I said, I don't want to be paid. I just want to see cryptos. They said, how much do you want to be paid? I don't want to be paid. And I also didn't want to say a number that was too high. So if, you know, if I said like, you know, $500, they said, oh, that's too high. I'm like, no, 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 you know, give me $50. <laughs> so I'm asking everyone, how much should I ask for? I don't want to be too high. I don't want to be too low. I don't need, you know, a travel fine. I don't need a hotel. I'm staying with my cousin anyway. Um, so I don't need a rental car or anything like that. Someone said, you know, well, you know, ask, ask for $500. Yeah, you know, so because that's your airfare and uh, you can negotiate. And so I said, Okay, I, I'll come talk. I want, I want five hundred dollars, and I'm like sweating, you know, until they come back and they said, okay, we want you to come speak. Um, you speak on this day. We'll let you see cryptos, and we're going to pay you twenty-five hundred dollars. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is me negotiating with the government for your tax dollars. <laughs> So I, I, got, I got to see crypto. I gave the talk, it was wonderful, uh, I was in CIA, they really loved the talk. Um, I, uh, okay, I'm going to tell you another short story about why I don't think that Al-Qaeda was using steganography. So the rumors at the time were that Al-Qaeda was using steganography. Where did these rumors come from? They came from the Italian tabloids. Why did the Italian tabloids think that? Well, a, an Al-Qaeda terrorist group had been broken up, captured by the police shortly after September 11th. And it was at the, a mosque, the Via Quaranta Mosque in Milan, Italy. And along with capturing the Al-Qaeda members, the police had also confiscated their computers, their laptops. And on these laptops, there had been pictures of naked women. And, and so the Italian tabloids were like, oh, these Al-Qaeda members are very strict Muslims. They would never look at pictures of naked women. They must have been using these pictures to hide messages with steganography. And so this just kind of rippled around the world because it's a great story, Al-Qaeda using steganography, you know, pictures of women. And then I was researching it, it's like, no, sometimes porn is just porn. <laughs> I won't go into the whole steganography, but okay, great story. So this is how I learned about cryptos. This is how I got into CIA. This is how I got to see cryptos. This is like achievement unlocked. I got to see cryptos. And yeah, and, and then I, I, uh, I got to do some rubbings of the sculpture. 
And I took those rubbings home with me, I made a mess of my suitcase, I had charcoal everywhere. And then I, I said, okay, somebody probably wants to see these. So I scanned them and I put them online. I had a little one page. You want to visit to crypto, sort of like an early blog. And this is what I saw. And, and here's a couple links to other things around the internet about cryptos. And here's the rubbings. And, and then I thought, okay, I'm done. I've, I've unlocked the achievements. I've gotten into CIA. I've gotten to see cryptos. I'm on to other things. I mean, I'm still making games. But then that web page changed my life because people started writing to me from all over the world saying, you saw cryptos. I'm interested in cryptos too. Did you see this? Did you see that? And, and you know, I'm like, I, I don't know. And, and so I'm a helpful person. So I started putting a frequently asked question list up on my website. And more questions are coming in. And then someone writes to me and they say, you know those four parts. And I'll, I'll tell you what the first three parts say. But if they say, you know those four parts of cryptos, and nobody knows what the fourth part says, I know the fourth part. I'm like, great, tell me what it is. I'll put it on my website. And they say, well, if you take this letter and this letter and this letter, it's my home address. It's proof that the government's watching me. <laughs> Okay, th thank you, thank you, and, and, you know, and, and I continue to get these. I, I've been doing this for over 10 years now, and I continue to get people writing to me pretty much every week saying that they, they think it's their home address, or they found three letters, and they typed it into Google, and it's a, a lake in Nepal, which proves that there's a line with Mars, and it comes back, and I mean, just all these, I say this lovingly, wackadoodle theories that, that are coming to me. And I realize that a lot of these people, they are, they're not trying to be trolls. These are people who are genuine, but have some trouble with, with reality. And I say this in a loving way, the schizophrenic people. And I keep getting these, and I, and I talked to a doctor about this. I said, why, why do I keep getting these letters from people that are you know, just having trouble? Why are these people so fascinated by codes? And he said, he believes that schizophrenia is when someone's going from reality and understanding reality to a point where they lose touch with reality. And there's a break along the way, a psychotic break. And he says, right as someone's going through that break where they're losing touch, things just don't start making sense. Like, say I look at the chandelier, right? And we see a chandelier there. But suppose I were to say, there's a little guy sitting up there in the chandelier. And, and you're going to look at it kind of like, you know, is it? You know, and, and you're not sure. And, and you're trying to make sense of that pattern, okay? So someone who's schizophrenic, they're gonna, and they're gonna start seeing a little guy, or they think they see a little guy. And so th that, that they're trying to make sense of patterns. And so looking at a code, like we look at something that we can read, but someone who's schizophrenic is looking at that thing, and, and especially the code, and, you know, if they keep looking at it, will it make sense? And they'll find patterns that may not actually be there. Okay, make sense? Okay, all right. So, alright, so let me go on to another, please, please work, okay, alright, so, oh great, alright, so some of these things I'm going to skip over really fast, but uh, I have a list of the world's most famous unsolved codes because someone at one point said, how famous is crypto, so I said, I don't know, and they said, well, is there a list, and, and they like, no, it would be too difficult to make a list of all the most famous unsolved codes, I'm like, okay, I'll make a list of all the most famous unsolved codes. <laughs> So um, this is Ilanka, and it's had millions of hits. It's something that just resonates with people. I mean, look how crowded this room is, which is great. So I'll be speaking very briefly about the ones that are highlighted in yellow, the Beale ciphers, the Voynich manuscript, Orbello ciphers, Zodiac killer ciphers, and cryptos. You know, it's a very subjective thing about how to list the fame of something, but I did it by opening up a bunch of books and looking at what's in the index and what has a, a video about it and documentaries. And then also at the very end, there's something there called the Friedman Tombstone, which isn't super famous, but it's a cool story, so I'm going to tell that one. Okay. So, Beale Ciphers. Um, this was a pamphlet that was published in the late 1800s uh, in uh, Virginia about someone who said that there was a treasure that was buried in Virginia and there were these three encrypted messages that said um, what the treasure was, where it was, and who it belonged to. Different order, but those are the three things. So uh, I was on a documentary, so if you want to learn more, go on to Netflix or YouTube and look for The Myth Hunters, two words, series three. There's a documentary. By the way, this picture, if you can see it when we were filming it, I'm in a hotel room there, so it's all mushed in. So at my left elbow there is the dresser, in, in, the, uh, in the hotel room behind me is the door that goes to the connected room. 
and the, the cameraman was sitting in the bathroom doorway, kind of pointing at me. <laughs> so it's just interesting how you think that someone's like, wow, this big, huge library, or you're sitting in the bathroom. Okay. Um, so, Bedford County, Virginia, you've probably read part of the United States, a bunch of you probably know, is in that area. I'll zoom it in a little bit. Uh, if you can see it, yeah, it's really hard to hear, but there's a red uh, shaded area in the middle there, and that's Bedford County. And uh, so in this pamphlet, in the mid-1880s, a man named Thomas Beale arrived with wagonfuls of gold and gems covered with tarps. And um, he and his, he had said that decades earlier, he and 30 other gentlemen, adventurers from Virginia, had gone west to seek their fortune, and they found gold accidentally while hunting buffalo. They accidentally went into this canyon and they found a vein that had gold and they also had a vein that had silver and, and they mined it for a year and a half and they got everything together and they put it in the wagon and they brought it back to Virginia. While they stopped, along the way they stopped off in St. Louis and they swapped some of the gold for gems. So by the time they got to Virginia, it's gold, silver, and gems. Great story so far. Okay. Um, told you that, told you that, told you that. Then, according to the pamphlet, Beale buried the treasure near Buford's Tavern, and he gave papers about it in a locked box to the innkeeper. We know the innkeeper was a real guy, Robert Morris. Then, according to the story, Beale sent a letter, he's back in St. Louis, and he says, um, if you haven't heard from me in a certain period of time, open the box. In the box you will find codes. I will send you a letter soon that has the key to these codes. He never sent that letter. All right, so 22 years later, 1845, according to the pamphlet, Morris opens the box, he finds these three messages, doesn't do anything with it. Decades later, decades later, before Morris dies, he, according to the pamphlet, he hands this box off to a young friend, an unnamed friend, and says, you know, do with it what you will. The unnamed friend, who's the author of this pamphlet, spends time with it and says that he manages to decode paper number two which is a book cipher which uses the Declaration of Independence. Okay? So if you're thinking of uh, you know, the Nicolas Cage movies, that maybe they got an inspiration from this, right? So the friend is never able to solve messages one and three, so he eventually writes a pamphlet, says everything he knows about it, and, and then he says, I'm done with it. Do, do what you will. This is what paper number two looked like. It's a whole bunch of numbers. 115, 73, 24, 807. So the way it works with the Declaration of Independence, and I apologize to you guys, I know this is impossible to see, but Declaration of Independence, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another, et cetera, et cetera. So if you take all those words and you number them, one, two, three, four, five. Now on the uh, paper number two, we have 115, 73, 24. So 115, you go to the 115th word there, and you take the first letter, which is an I. You go to the 73rd word, and the word hold, and you take the first letter, which is an H. So I, H, A, V, E, I, have. And you keep going through all the numbers, and you get a message, which uh, I have deposited in the county of Bedford, about four miles from Buford's in an excavation or vault six feet below the surface of the ground, the following articles belonging jointly to the parties whose names are given in number three herewith. And I won't read you the whole thing, but it's basically saying what it contained. Thousands of pounds of gold and silver and gems, and, and the story about how that some of the things have been swapped out in St. Louis. And it says that the above is securely packed in iron pots with iron covers. The vault is roughly lined with stone, and the vessels rest on solid stone and are covered with others. Paper number one describes the exact locality of the vault so that no difficulty will be had in finding it. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, and that's number one. We don't know what it says. That's number three, supposedly the names and residences of who owns it. So, was this a real treasure or was it a hoax? Yeah, there are inconsistencies in the language. People have really spent, a, there's, first of all, there's a lot of people that have been digging holes all around the different county. That, that, that's all that's been happening. But people have looked at the way that the pamphlet was written, and there's some words that are in it which probably wouldn't have been in the language at the time that they say the pamphlet was written. Like the word stampede started coming into common usage at a certain time. And they, if this pamphlet was written before that, and they used the word stampede, oh yes. And also, let's do the sniff test on the story. 
Somebody went all the way west. Okay. They found mines of gold and silver. Okay. They mined it for 18 months and nobody heard about it. You know, you think about the miners, 49ers, that, that story got out pretty fast. So that's you know, starting to pass the, the, the sniff test. And it's 30 guys doing this, keeping the secret. And Okay, so, so there's that. And um, there's also, okay, and then they, they come all the way back to Virginia in these wagons. And they stop in St. Louis, but they don't. They don't leave it in St. Louis. They only swap it for gems and bring it all the way back to Virginia. And why didn't, why did they, you know, St. Louis is a perfectly valid city. It's got banks and, and things. So, and, and also that paper number three only had about 600 characters. And supposedly they're saying, here's everyone that owned it and their addresses, all in 600 characters for 30 people. And that's, again, the, the sniff test is a little, a little weird there. So, some people have researched and said they think the thing was a hoax, and they think this is why it was a hoax, is that there was a newspaper uh, that was running low on money, and may have the guy who owned it, John William Sherman, who was also a playwright, may have written up this story about the Beale Cyphers as a way of selling pamphlets. Right? So, there were many family and business connections to Ward and to Buford's Tavern. He had purchased the Virginian newspaper in 1885, and, and the newspaper did run into financial difficulties and it and closed in 1887. So this was the ad for this pamphlet, the Beale Papers Containing Authentic Statements. It ran 84 times in one newspaper, in the Virginian newspaper, never in any other paper. And at the bottom it says price or address W.W. W. Watts, uh, 1001 Main Street. Well, Watts was the name of a paper boy at the Virginian. And 1001 Main Street was the address of the Virginia newspaper. So all of these things are leading people to think that that was just a fictional, a really good fictional tale. Um, and this is just a map showing it's a long way to go from the west all the way back to the beginning. So it's also possible that this may have been a Freemason story because the Freemason, anybody here a Freemason? You know, or has a family member that's a Freemason? Okay, well, you may, Freemasons, they have a, you know, a long history of telling stories to encourage people to learn and encouraging people to do their own research. And remember, these iron pots, iron covers on stone. So this may have also been something about Freemasonry. And, and there, there's a story here about a, a Masonic fable called The Farmer and His Sons, um, which is a farmer, he's about to die, he's worried that his family will not prosper, so he tells his children that out in the fields there is a treasure that is hidden. And so after he dies, his sons are always out there working the fields looking for the treasure, looking for the treasure. They never find anything, but the farm prospers, and so the family prospers. So sometimes the search of something for something is as valuable or more valuable than what you're actually looking for. Okay, uh, so okay, Freeman Tombstone. This is something wasn't super famous, but it's a great story. So William and Elizabeth Friedman are really the founders of American cryptology. They met uh, in a think tank by a really eccentric guy named William Fabian. Uh, he was he called himself Colonel Colonel Fabian. He had millions of dollars and could do whatever he wanted, so he set up a research laboratory. And he brought in architects, and he set up a bunch of cigar boxes on a table, and he said, I want a lab that looks like that. So they made a lab that looks like that. Looks like, you know, building made of cigar boxes. And so he set up, he had different groups that did research on different things. One of them was a group that he said he wanted to prove that William Shakespeare had not really written his own works, that it had been written by Francis Bacon. Another one was he set up a genetics lab of people that were studying the effects of moonlight on plant growth, and he had other things going on. And he would basically go around to someone and, you're smart, you're hired, and he'd bring them over to his research lab. <laughs> so uh, this is the Baconian cipher that people were looking to find codes in the works of William Shakespeare. And again, I don't know if you can see it, but it's groups of five letters, so uh, also a biliteral cipher. So imagine that instead of a and B, it's one and zero. So one, 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 one is an A. One, 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 zero is a B. One, 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 zero, one is a C, and on. So there were theories that because the fonts and the typefaces and everything in 
Shakespeare's works were a little off, that they may have been a code by Bacon to prove that he had been the one that had actually written the, uh, the Shakespearean uh, plays. So William Friedman is a geneticist at the lab, and Elizabeth Smith is a Shakespeare researcher, one of the people that, that uh, Colonel Taylor, you, you're hired, and brought over. And so they got to know each other because Friedman was a photographer and taking pictures of the Shakespearean works, and also because he wanted to court uh, Elizabeth, and they eventually fell in love. Now, he was not a cryptographer, but Elizabeth had learned to become a cryptographer, so she taught William, keep this in mind, she taught him about codes. And then he got really interested and learned more, and he wrote some papers, and those papers became super famous. So they got married in April 1917. So now we go to the United States, World War I. The United States had entered World War I in May 1917, and the United States didn't really have a code lab. So Colonel Fabian said, well, my people are looking for codes, and the Shakespeare works here. You can have them. They can form the code group. So, yes, that became the United States Code Group. And Elizabeth and William created the curriculum for the first batch of World War I cryptographers. They taught them about cipher. And then continued training cryptographers and eventually created the foundation for what today is known as the American Code Breaking Agency, NSA the National Security Agency. So that first batch of cryptographers, there's this big class picture. Well, if you get a chance to look closely at the picture, some people are looking forward and some are looking to the side. Forward, side. One, one, zero, one, one. There's a code hidden in the class picture. <laughs> code says the phrase, knowledge is power. And Friedman kept that picture on his desk for the rest of his career. And, and uh, if you can see it circled here. And in 1957, after they retired, the Friedmans got together and they wrote a book called The Shakespearean Ciphers Examined, where they just debunked everything, top to bottom, left to right. If you're ever curious about this, read their book. And it's kind of, they wrote it in a very humorous fashion. Okay, I told you about that, I told you about that. She went on to become an amazing cryptanalyst. By the way, William created the term cryptanalyst. And anybody here that knows codes and has heard the term index of coincidence, he's the guy that created that term. I mean, just groundbreaking what they were doing. And she, remember, she taught him about cryptography. She went on, she was cracking the codes of Nazis and of drug smugglers and other World War I spies and being written up in the paper, hugely famous. So when you hear about William and Elizabeth Friedman, you could also just hear Elizabeth and William Friedman. She was just as famous as he was. All right. They were all about codes. They created Christmas invitations and ciphers. They sent encrypted messages to their kids. I mean, I wish I could have known these people. <laughs> and, but they wrote that book about Shakespearean ciphers examined. And on page 257 of that book, they hid a code. Okay, at the, way at the bottom in the italics. And again, I apologize over there, but you guys might be able to see it. Some of those letters look a little bolder than others. Slightly different font, a little bolder, I'll zoom it up even more. Like if you look at the M in limitation, you can see it's a little darker. Or, um, yeah, and anyway, I'll go on. All right, so with the fonts, it was like bold, not bold, 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 not bold. It was that ones and zeros, the Baconian cipher again. And the message it says is, I did not write the plays, F. Bacon. <laughs> I just moved to Washington, D.C. about two years ago. I'm a, fan, I'm a Friedman fangirl, so I immediately go to Arlington Cemetery, one of my first visits. I want to see the Friedman tombstone. And I go in there, there's got to be a code. And I didn't see a code. I was so disappointed. It just says William Friedman, Elizabeth Friedman, is very bottom knowledge is power. And then I took a closer look at this, this tombstone. Right, it's the third one from the left, way at the bottom there. Third one from the left. Right there at the bottom. Knowledge is power. And after William had died, Elizabeth designed his tombstone. And where it says knowledge is power, some of the letters are with a serif font, where they have the little things at the end of them, and some don't. So it's ones and zeros. And so it's B-A-B-A-A-N. -A 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 
A-A-B-A-B, and it comes, it's a very short message, but it comes out to say W-F-F, William F. Friedman. So just a nice little love story there. So another one of the codes that they had worked on, segueing into this, is the Voynich Manuscript. All right, hundreds of years old, hundreds of pages, messages we can't read, an alphabet we don't even recognize, pictures of things we don't know, and flowers and plants that aren't like current flowers and plants. <coughs> Huge mystery. If anyone, and I have a book up here if anyone wants to get a closer look. This is the best book about Voynich Manuscript by Clemens. You can come up and see it later. So I'll go through this fast because I know you guys can't see it. Um, 1400s, it was radiocarbon dated, weird plants. I've, I've had botanists look at this and they say, yeah, the top part, I recognize those flowers. They never have roots like that. Hmm. Or they go in and they say, yeah, the leaves, I recognize those leaves, but it would never have those kinds of flowers. So it's, it's like scrambled plants. And there's also all these pictures of little naked women in, in little great green pools of water. And the pools of water always have an input and then an output. So it's like green streams flowing over them. Right. Here's a, a passion flower. Anyone who knows passion flowers knows that they have to have ten petals. This one has five. Why? We don't know. Right. Um, if the language were transcribed, and again, this is not like an alpha, any alphabet we know, it would have a theme like podero, adam, li, sho, al, di, ocho, oto. So it has a rhythm like a language, but we can't match it to anything. Also, there's no punctuation anywhere in the entire manuscript. Um, we can't really tell what's a vowel, what isn't. And it, it's hard to tell also, do we know what's lowercase and what's uppercase? Like imagine if we had an alien come in and they're seeing someone's done, written the letter M. You know, mom, M and M O M, mom. But they won't know, well, this is an M, this is an O, and that's an M. They won't know that M, is that one letter, is it two letters, is it three letters? They have no, nothing to base it on. So. We're making our guess as to what's a character, but we may be completely off. Uh, there are other things from around the 15th century that look similar, like herbals, the legitimate herbals, the materia medica, uh, and it's possible it was used for botanical identification. Uh, it's, it's currently at the Yale University Beinecke Rare Book Library. It has been lit out very rarely, and one of the times it was lit out, I was there, and I have, I've created an entire Voynich manuscript you know, from downloading pictures on the internet. Um, and, and so it was exciting to see it, and the way things unfolded, I still have no idea what it says, but it was really cool to look at it. Okay. And some of the pages fold out, and this may or may not be a clue, but on this big fold out page, way up at the top in one of the circles, there is a castle on its side. And if you look at the battlements of this castle, you'll see it's not like the square way, but they do these dips. And that's an architectural element called a swallowtail merlon. And at the time, currently you'll see castles all over that have that, but at the time we think that was, this was created, there was really only one area that happened, which was in the area of northern Italy. So that may give a clue to where the manuscript was created. We don't know. Uh, maybe it's a hoax. Uh, at the time, uh, what's the, how far back can we trace it? And we can trace it five minutes. Okay, all right, can we make it ten? Okay, we'll, we'll see. So, um, <laughs> so uh, it was it purchased by Emperor Rudolph in the 16th century for 600 gold ducats, which would be about $80,000 today. He was known for collecting oddities. So maybe someone created an oddity for him to buy. So that's possible. Uh, yeah, um, okay. Uh, people come out a few times a year saying that they've solved the Polish manuscript. It's like a common thing. It's like people contacting me and saying, hey, it's my home address. So if you want to learn more, if you, if they'll say, and the newspapers will pick it up uncritically. They'll say, oh, somebody from New Hampshire says they've solved the Voynich manuscript. And the, oh yeah, other, and it goes ripples across the world. And those of us in the cryptography field are going, no, no, hello, no, it hasn't been solved. 
Um, so we kind of say, oh, that's wrong theory 2018 number three, right? And it's like, it's like number in comments. But if you want to read more about these crazy theories, you can go to a site called cyphermysteries.com by a guy named Nick Pellin. Um, and, and he has at the top of his webpage, it's great. If you have ever found yourself asking, quote, where can I find out about XYZ moderately loopy but eerily hard to disprove Voynich manuscript theory, quote, then you've come to the right place. And, uh, and he lists them, and he has them about the Voynich, and he has them about Beale ciphers, and he has them about the Zodiac killer ciphers. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, can't even cover face. It's, it's, uh, you can read about it. <laughs> uh, Doorbell a Cipher uh, was written by composer Edward Elgar, who did a Pomp and Circumstance, da, 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 you know, in the, uh, when you graduate. And he wrote this message to uh, a woman. Uh, she was the daughter of, of a friend, and he thought she'd be able to read it, and she couldn't. Later, she wrote her memoir, and she said, I'd appreciate if someone could tell me what it says, and no one's been able to solve it. It looks like a simple substitution cipher, but maybe it has something to do with music, maybe he screwed it up, I don't know. Zodiac ciphers, very briefly, you know there's movies about the Zodiac Killer, there's other, he did send, this is one of his actual messages, we, we number them by the number of characters, like Z340, some of them were solved at the time, some are still unsolved. Again, you'll see things on TV, like the History Channel just did something last year about Zodiac Cipher Solved. No, no, it wasn't, it wasn't solved. And um, yeah, that's a really annoyed by that. Um, cryptos, I've already told you most of the story. That, that's the crypto sculpture. Those are the rubbings. Each one of those is done on an 8.5 by 11 inch piece of paper. So you can see the size. Um, yeah, the NSA took a look at it. They couldn't solve it. Uh, I got some memos, and other sculptures that were created by Sanborn. Right. And uh, Scott, you need to invite me back to give this talk next year. I'll go into this in some more detail. You want to go for two and a half hours next year? What? Two and a half hours next year? Two and a half hours, yeah. That's what I'm All right. All right. So the first part uses a cipher alphabet. So at the top, so you get the main alphabet, 26 letters. And at the bottom, you take the letters of the keyword, cryptos, mush them all to the left, mush everything you have left to the right. So you still have 26 letters, but they're scrambled in a very specific way. And then if you take all those, those 26 letters and you shift each letter, each line by one, so you can read the word cryptos at the top. And also if you read down the left-hand row, again, I apologize. Down the left-hand row, you can also read the same keyword, cryptos. Now imagine we're going to put a different word down the left-hand row, and we're going to make it palimpsest. So we have cryptos, and then down the left we have the word palimpsest, which is a word for a scroll that had a message on it, and you scrape that message off and uh, written a new message, so you can see parts of the message showing through. So part one, that's the cipher text, using cryptos and palimpsest, between subtle shading and the absence of light lies the nuance of illusion. And illusions misspelled, that's not me, that's the sculpture. I've asked Sanborn, was that a mistake? He says no, but it's not what it is, it's where it is. It's the orientation or position. You don't know what that means. Um, part two starts at row three, goes down to the bottom. Keywords cryptos and abscissa. Abscissa, mathematical term, means the x-coordinate on a graph. It was totally invisible. How is that possible? They used the Earth's magnetic field, X. The information was gathered and transmitted underground to an unknown location. X. Does Langley know about this? They should. It's buried out there somewhere. X. Who knows the exact location? Only WW. This was his last message. X. 38 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north. 77 degrees, 8 minutes, 44 seconds west. ID by Rose actually did have a mistake there. X. Layer 2. Part 3. Different system, transposition system. Slowly, desperately slowly, the remains of passage debris that encumbered the lower part of the doorway was removed. With trembling hands, I made a tiny breach in the upper left-hand corner. And then, widening the hole a little, I inserted the candle and peered in. The hot air escaping from the chamber caused the flame to flicker. The presently details of the room within emerged from the mist. X, can you see anything? Q. Part four, we don't know. 
Uh, yeah, just pictures of it from different angles. I promise I'm going as fast as I possibly can. <laughs> Uh, this is Ed Scheidt, who is the CIA cryptographic director, taught Sanborn about cipher systems. Uh, Sanborn did give a hint. He said that the word Berlin is in there, and clock is in there, so we've gone looking at all kinds of different clocks. Hasn't helped us. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, did you mention code? Uh, there's references to cryptos in one of Dan Brown's novels. Dan Brown did not help Sanborn. The Brown novels were printed over a decade later. Brown wasn't even writing at the time the this was created. Uh, I did help Brown with some of his research. He named a character after me in one of his books, Nola Kay, The Scramble for Ilanka. And if you want to learn more, Simon Singh's book, The Code Book, excellent on, on cryptographies, David Kahn, The Codebreaker, Schneier.com website, about Friedman, uh, Ronald Clark, The Man Who Wrote Purple, and about Elizabeth Friedman. There's two books, not just one, two. The Woman Who Smashed Codes and A Life in Code, that we just, just published last year. Do we have time for any questions? No. Thank you for your patience.